So, yeah, it may seem strange that AMD have invited uh, somebody from ARM to come along and talk to you today uh, about this, and indeed, in some ways, it is. Actually, for most of what we're talking about today, there is great agreement between ARM and AMD about what we're talking about. Much of what we believe in terms of the technology directions where the industry is going, in terms of heterogeneous computing, uh, there's huge agreement between us. Long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, one of the founders of ARM, who's now the CTO, Mike Muller, went to Microprocessor Forum and he got given this lovely little prize. It's a pers one of these per perspex blocks uh, which contains potted uh, dyes from all of those microprocessors uh, which were being launched that year in 1992. If you look at them, count the architectures, um, you'll see 11 architectures in common use in 1992. All of those were highly successful architectures and you guys at the developer community were writing code for them. I don't think it's too unfair to say that if we look now, in 2011, if we look at the survivors, there's two. There's two architectures. There's x86 and ARM. And so kind of, that's why I'm here today. I'm talking at the AMD conference. It all kind of makes sense. What were the lessons we should learn from that? Some good architectures have succeeded over the years. It's not necessarily the case that all the bad ones disappeared because they were bad. There were a whole bunch of other economic effects that took place. Power did matter over those 20 years, but actually it's come to matter more over the time. Um, one of the really important economic effects is that too much variety can be a bad thing. Too much variety for developers, the ecosystem of developers who are writing the code for these devices. Developers need to be able to support a range of platforms in a range of market segments for a range of devices. And they need to be able to reuse your, you need to be able to reuse your code across these platforms. And too much variety, too many different tool chains, too many different instruction set architectures is actually a negative economic effect uh, for the industry and particularly for you guys. If we look back at the first era and uh, look at supercomputers and mainframes, it's just functionality. You build a device, does it do what I want it to do? If it doesn't, build a bigger, more expensive device. Uh, we've heard this morning about the original supercomputers that weighed 200,000 pounds. These are the devices I'm talking about. Pure functionality. Did it work? Did it not do what I wanted? As we move towards the personal computer era, that metric, that metric that everybody's trying to uh, fit, changes. It's functionality per dollar. It's functionality divided by the price you, you, you paid for it. When we move towards portable devices and battery-powered devices, even laptops, we find that's changed again. We've got functionality, but it's functionality per unit power and per unit cost. And this is what everybody was building in the 2000s. If we look where we're doing now, I would claim that that metric has changed somewhat. It's functionality per unit energy and per unit cost. And that's what everybody's building for, for this range of digital devices. So, hmm, it's our strategic direction. Actually, it's several people's strategic direction. Functionality divided by energy and divided by cost. The tricky thing is that this is a very hard metric to optimize for. It's really quite complex. Power affects pretty much all aspects of design and several that you hadn't thought of when you first designed it. The good news is, if you crack this design metric, you own a whole bunch of the simpler metrics as well. And I'll come on to talk about why getting this metric right, functionality divided by energy divided by cost, works so well for so many market segments and why you need to care about it. So you might think servers is the place that uh, nobody worries about power. But actually it's not the same. It, it's just the same. They worry about power. It's just the size of their numbers are a bit bigger than we're used to. Um, getting more than 10 kilowatts of power into a 19-inch rack is really, really hard. Getting 10 kilowatts of heat out of a 19-inch rack is even harder. 
The server guys actually build these things together uh, into uh, shipping containers, and getting more than about 500 kilowatts of heat out of a standard shipping container is, is real hard as well. These guys are now spending more money on power in and more money on cooling out than they are on the actual hardware themselves. So power is pervasive. Power solves everything that we're trying to do, not just in the one watt environment that people think of in, in, in mobile phones. As I say, even the server guys sometimes struggle to build, build data centers where they can't get power from the grid. And it's no accident that people are now building these data centers in places with lots of cold water, preferably cold air as well, uh, next to uh, areas of cheap power generation like uh, hydroelectric power stations. I understand Oregon is, is, the, uh, is the place of choice these days, but I'm sure it's going to move to ships offshore in the Arctic before Moore's law doesn't anymore dictate what we can and cannot do. In the past, uh, the silicon foundries, uh, like global foundries, people like that, um, every year they produced a new silicon process and that and Moore's Law was its reflection of that capability, gave us PPA improvements every year. Power, the power went down, performance, the performance went up, uh, the area got smaller, it was all fine. So we just got bigger and faster, all good stuff. Not anymore. Expectations used to be very much of a, about 20% frequency uplift uh, every time there was a new silicon node. Um, every couple of years, the foundries would bring out uh, a new, a new uh, process with a new geometry. Uh, the transistors would get smaller and smaller, the frequency would go up. Hmm. I don't wish to rain on your parade, but um, the current best prediction from us, and yes, there are different views on this, and this is an amalgamation of industry and analyst data, but the current best prediction is that actually, going out over the next few years, you can see that it's flat or going down. Now you'll notice it always gets worse five generations out. This is, I'm afraid, a feature of these sort of predictions. Everybody thinks it's going to drop off the end of the world in five generations. It kind of never does, but even so, the more optimistic interpretation of this graph is certainly worrying enough. Um, there are some error bars, and the error bars might actually save us. Um, but they're not huge, and the error bars may go the other way. It may actually get much worse. And it certainly isn't going to get much better. We can hope for a bit of improvement in performance over the next few years. But it's no longer going to be our saviour. It's no longer going to get us out of jail. So what did we used to do? Well, let's look at a standard chip uh, which we built in 45 nanometers, and then we moved it along a silicon process. We shrank it. Uh, to 32 nanometers. So the green area is the bit that got smaller. And of course what we tend to do is we use all of that extra silicon to put new functionality in the chip. Shrink and add, new functionality, it's about the same area. In mobile, for example, pretty much every single wireless chip is about nine millimeters by nine millimeters. It always has been, it always, well, probably always will. It, it's just one of the rules, nobody can explain it. It's, it's just economics and packaging and numbers of pins. However, there's a nasty thing coming. Look at that 45 nanometer chip, compare it to a 22 nanometer chip, give it a couple of generations. Sure enough, the area of our chip, the bit that we've uh, designed, has got uh, four times smaller. It's a quarter of the area that it used to be. And the frequency's gone up a bit. The power, however, hasn't really changed significantly. Don't get too hung up on these numbers. The numbers are exactly wrong, roughly right. Don't, don't, don't get too hung up on it. And different people will have different numbers. But there's a general trend, which trust me, everyone agrees on. Go to 11 nanometers, well that's great. I've shrunk it much more in the corner of the die. I can put much more functionality on my chip. The area is now a sixteenth. It's all scaling beautifully. The frequency's even gone up a reasonable amount. The power has gone down a bit. So, if that was the exploitable silicon that I could afford to power at 45 nanometers, if that was my power budget, if that was a bit that I could actually afford to use out of my battery, moving to the newer generations, I can't afford to power it all up. If we look at 22 nanometers, the power is, as I say, about the same. So, I can only afford to power a quarter of my chip at once. Moving on to 11 nanometers, it's all got much worse. I got 10% of the chip powered up. 
if I power the whole chip up, it's going to use 50 times too much power. It's going to melt. It's going to ruin my battery. It's going to just not work at all. So what we've now got is dark silicon. We can afford to build chips, 9 millimeters by 9 millimeters. We can't afford to power it all up at the same time. And that's going to affect everything we do. It's going to affect the way we build uh, CPUs, it's going to affect the way we build GPUs, it's going to affect the way we design the interconnect between them. It's really going to be troublesome. Lack of power scaling with silicon scaling severely limits our options about what we can do, what we can build. But what can we do? Well, Moore's law, not dead, we can have more transistors. We just can't power them all at the same time. So what are we going to do with all these new transistors? We can put down lots of cash. Well, actually we've done that. We've kind of built as much cash as we can usefully fit to devices. We can build multi-cores. Actually, that's what we've been doing for about five years now, um, and that's worked out pretty well for all of us. We could go to many-core, and I differentiate between multi-core and many-core by uh, really Multi-core for me is 1 to 4, 1 to 8, those sort of numbers. Any, any more than that, and it's a different computational problem. And for those of you who've tried programming them, uh, you'll certainly understand that it's different from a software perspective. We can fit domain-specific processors, by which I mean processors designed uh, specifically to solve certain computational problems. It could be a video processor, it could be a graphics processor, audio-specific processors. Uh, there are any number out there which we can uh, offload processing power to and get them to do that computation in a, in a more energy efficient way. So my contention is that all of these technological factors combine to form the perfect storm. It's all about heterogeneous processing. It's the only game in town. It's the only way we can use all these transistors effectively to provide you, the developer community, with systems that will execute your code in a, in a better way, a more efficient way, a faster way, you will be able to utilize with applications that we haven't even thought of yet to provide a more compelling user experience. Heterogeneous processing, handing things off to different types of processes for different types of workload, and aggressive power management. Because as I said, we can't afford to power it all up at the same time.